Um, okay, so let's go through these uh, one one by one. Um, so we have right here the absolute uh, maximum. So uh, first thing to notice is f of a. What does that represent? When you're looking at a function, that represents the right the y value. So the value of the function, right? So um, so the value of the function f of a is an absolute maximum. Actually, um, let me change this just because I don't want it to confuse. So this actually, uh, let's change it to uh, C, just so that we don't confuse it with, well, then I did, I have that C. Uh, <laughs> what should we do? Uh, okay, I'm just gonna change them all to Cs because that's what I did over here and um, I'd already written A over there. Let's see, I did it again. If F of C, okay. All right, so uh, F of C is an absolute maximum on I if F of C is greater than or equal to F of X for all X and I. So basically, just to translate it, it just means the absolute maximum is the absolute largest value of the function, right? So, um, okay, so if you look at just our sample graph right here that I put down on the left side, um, what's the absolute maximum <laughs> of this uh, function? It's, it's at A, right? Okay, so the absolute yeah. maximum is right here. So what is the absolute maximum? The absolute maximum is f of a, right? It's the y value. Where is it located? At x equals a, right? So make sure you make that distinction. When you're talking about maximums and minimums and, and that kind of stuff, the, the maximum or the minimum is the value of the function, the y value. And then when you want to know, okay, well, where is it? That's the x value. Does that make sense, the difference between the two? Yeah? Okay. All right. Now the next one, uh, let's see. So the same thing, just the minimum. So the absolute smallest value of the function, what is that? Where is it located in this case? It's at C, right? The, this one that I marked as C right here. So this is the absolute minimum. Now here it's easy to pick it off from the graph, right? When you're looking at it, it's very clear, oh, it's right there, and then the absolute minimum is down there. Um, okay, um, so then what's the difference between absolute, oh, there's actually another name for it. Um, I should put it down here somewhere. Um, these are also called uh, global. So global maximum and minimum, you might also see it uh, that way. But now what's the difference between that and local maximums and minimums? So local maximums and minimums, um, notice how it says here that um, for absolute, it has to be, the inequality has to be satisfied for all x in the interval, right? But then what does it say for the local? For all x in some open interval containing c. So now when you're looking at it, um, for example, let me see here. Um, let me pick, how about this color? Okay. If I take a look right here at D, right there, is that the absolute maximum? No, but it's some kind of a maximum, right? Because it's larger than everything around it. Do you guys agree? Okay, so that's what we call a local maximum. If you make an open interval containing that number D, then notice that 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 dot, the purple dot, is a local maximum because it's larger than everything in that interval. Does that make sense? So then you call that a local maximum. Okay, do we have any other local maximums? Or is that the only one? What about A? Is A a, a local maximum? It actually is not. <laughs> so it kind of looks like it should be, right? But actually, endpoints cannot be local maximums because you can't make an open interval 
around it, right? So like if I say, oh, open interval right there. Well, no, because it ends at, the function ends at A, right? So what? It, why can't you just make a open interval uh, like this, for example? Would that work? No, because it doesn't contain A, right? So it has to contain A, and it has to be open. But that's not actually possible, right? So endpoints, is it possible for endpoints to be local, maximums, or minimums? No. no. Okay, but notice it can be an absolute maximum, right, or minimum. Does that make sense? So that's a key difference. All right. Um, let's see here. So what about local minimums? Do we have any local minimums? Aha, notice. But I already have an absolute minimum there. Is that a problem? No. That is not a problem. That is right. So you can have a point be an absolute extrema and a local, both. Um, that's OK. So this is an absolute minimum, but it's also a local minimum. What's the only thing you can't have? You can't have a local max or min at an endpoint, right? Okay, now uh, I have a separate question. Uh, is it possible to have more than one absolute maximum? Or minimum for that matter. What about, for example, sine? Doesn't that have more than one maximum? So like if I graph sine, What's the absolute? So isn't that the absolute maximum and that one the absolute maximum? Isn't that two absolute maximums just right there? And then you keep drawing, you have infinitely many? No? That doesn't, that doesn't have anything to do with it. But what do you guys think? They're all the same value, exactly. So. So one thing too that uh, you just want to kind of be careful with it. So you can have an absolute maximum or minimum at more than one x value, but it would have to be the same value. Does that make sense? So the absolute max, for example, for sine, what's the absolute maximum of sine of x? One. It's one, right? That's the absolute maximum of sine. Where is it located? Well, there's infinitely many points, infinitely many points where it reaches the absolute maximum. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. Okay, good, good job. Good thinking there, peeps. Okay, uh, now this critical point business, this is a bit interesting. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, what color would be good? Magenta, this one right here. Okay, all right. Critical number and critical point. So what's the difference between critical number and critical point? So critical number is just the x value, and a critical point is the actual point, x and y. Uh, often I'll mix it up and just say critical point always, uh, but that's, that's the difference. But what is it? It's when the derivative, it's the point where the derivative <laughs> equals to zero. So graphically, what does that look like when the derivative equals zero? It's a flat spot, right? So horizontal tangent line. So this is flat spot. Or the derivative does not exist. What does that look like? Okay. What else? Vertical asymptote. What else? There's a whole bunch of them, right? So actually, okay, so why don't we do this because I think we're going to, so examples of uh, functions with points where f prime of x does not exist because there's a lot of them so we want to kind of have them in our in our brain here all right so you guys said uh, endpoints um, okay vertical asymptotes right so for example this right 
So asymptotes, asymptotes, okay. Uh, that's one example. What's another one you guys said? Okay, jump discontinuity, really any kind of discontinuity, but jump discontinuity. So for example, something like this. So that the derivative does not exist there either. Uh, what else? Cusps, good. Looks like a butt, like that, see? Uh, what else? There are more. We talked about them before. Absolute value function, right? So what is that? So spiky points, right? Like the absolute value, so spikes. So kind of like cusps, just a little bit different. Uh, what else? Where else does the derivative not exist? So if it's discontinuous, right? Well, I guess might as well throw it in. The removable discontinuity, right? Really, it's any kind of discontinuity, but. Uh, of the derivative, not of the function, but of the derivative. Because so you have the discontinuities, right? Which those are pretty obvious, but then you have things like this, like the spikes and the cusps. There's one more, one more that is not super common, but common enough. It's continuous, but the derivative doesn't exist. Infinite what? Well, we already did that one. That's the vertical asymptote. You guys remember? No? Vertical tangent line. You guys remember that? So like, for example, the cube root of x looks like this. At 0, for example, it has a vertical tangent line. So the derivative doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, OK. So since those are points where the derivative does not exist, then uh, those would be called critical points, right? Does that make sense? OK, now, so there's a couple of, of key things that we want to kind of get a hold of here. Um, so uh, for today, we're going to focus on, um, on absolute maximums and minimums. So we'll look at local maximums and minimums uh, a different day uh, next week. But so for now, let's just think about um, absolute maximums and minimums. Um, so one thing to notice um, is that, so if I look at my picture right here, so notice here I have an absolute maximum at the endpoints, right? So it's possible to have maximum or uh, absolute extreme at the endpoints. Um, or where's my other one here? It's at it's at the same spot as a local minimum. What do you notice about um, about this one? Okay, and then let's go back to our uh, pictures over here. Okay, so if I look at these uh, pictures here, uh, for example, this spike one, um, does that have an absolute maximum or minimum? Yes, it has. The, where is it? It's at it's at the spike, right? And that's also a critical point, right? Okay. Uh, now, what about the this one with the cusp? Also, right? So the max, the max. Okay. Now, this one with the jump discontinuity. Um, This is the critical point, right, at the discontinuity. Um, is that a uh, an absolute maximum or minimum? It isn't, right? Not not at the discontinuity. Uh, where is the absolute maximum for this one? Yeah, it's right here, right? The max is right there. Which is that a critical point? 
It is, because what are the critical points again? It's where the derivative does not exist or equals zero, equals zero right? Okay, so you kind of see a common theme here. What about this one? What's the maximum of that? It's infinity and number? No, so then what's the maximum? It doesn't, it doesn't have a maximum. If it's infinity, it, it doesn't have a maximum because it keeps on going, right? Um, okay, so all right, so so after those observations, let me see. Uh, let's write down a couple of things here. Um, where can I write it down? Okay, I'm going to erase this stuff over here. We don't need this. Okay, so let's write down a couple of important theorems. Important theorems. And then we'll take a look at some example examples. Okay. Um, okay, so suppose F is continuous on a closed, and we won't prove these because they're a bit uh, difficult for us. If you take advanced calculus, you'll prove them. But, you know, so. Um, so suppose F is continuous on a closed interval. Uh, then F attains uh, its absolute max and absolute min on the interval. Okay, so does that make sense intuitively if you think about um, continuous functions? So now keep in mind we're talking about a closed interval, right? So if you think of, uh, for example, so here we have a couple. Let's say, for example, um, let's say this one I close it off. Well, maybe let me cut it off a little bit right here. Okay, this function right here, uh, is that continuous, the spiky one? Uh, right, yeah, on, on the closed interval. So it is continuous, right? So does it achieve uh, absolute maximum or and absolute maximum and absolute minimum? It does, right? Where's the maximum? We already said it's right here, right? Where's the minimum? It's right here, right? On the left endpoint. Okay, so <coughs> if it's um, so, then notice then that if if you have a closed interval, then where is the where are the maximums and minimums located? Every time they're either in one of two places. Endpoints End or? Or? Does not exist, right? So notice they're always at the critical points or at the endpoints. Does that make sense? Yes? You with me? Okay. All right. So, uh, second theorem. Um, maybe not a theorem, but let's let's say technique for finding absolute extrema. Okay. So one, find all critical points. Okay, so the way we want to think of critical points is their potential maximums or minimums. So notice we saw all those examples. So sometimes they are maximums or minimums, but other times they are not. So every critical point might be a, uh, a maximum or a minimum. Yes? Does that make sense? Okay, so if we have those, um, then how would we be able to tell whether it is a maximum or a minimum? So imagine you don't have the graph, so you don't have the picture, you're just given a function. So you find the critical points. What's the determining factor whether it's a maximum or a minimum? The absol absolute, so specifically just absolute maximum or minimum. What determines whether it's the absolute maximum?
that's that's the key thing right the value so it's only if the value of the function at that point is the absolute largest right and what do you what would you compare it to what's the other spot where the maximum or minimum might be endpoints. at the endpoints does that make sense so it's either at a critical point or it's an endpoint so the second thing we want to do is compare the value and when we say value, we're talking about the y value of f at uh, critical points and endpoints. Oh my gosh. Okay, and then after that, choose the largest and the smallest and those are your absolute maximum and absolute minimum yeah does that make sense strategy okay you guys ready for an example so any questions first before we we get into an example yes No, this is for the absolute, absolute, absolute only. So we're going to look at local later, but right now only for absolute maximum and minimum. So local is a little bit different. Any other questions? No? You guys are ready for to do a problem? All right, let's see. Okay. Let's see. All right, how about find one here? Uh, let's see. Find the absolute maximum and minimum of of f of x equals to. Um, x squared plus x to the two thirds and um, minus two to three. Okay. All right. So um, the hardest thing about these kinds of problems is not really knowing what to do. The hardest thing is that, so this is one type of function, but then you need to be able to do all these things that we're going to do for, um, so for these kinds of functions, but then you also need to be able to do it with all kinds of trig functions and you need to be able to do it with um, exponential functions and logarithmic functions. So you have all the different kinds of functions and uh, what are the steps that we need to follow? We need to find the critical points. critical points, which means find the derivative, right? And then you need to find where the derivative zero. is zero or does not exist, right? So what does that mean? That means we're going to solve an equation. So you're going to have to solve a whole bunch of different, so or solve all kinds of different equations for different types of um, functions. That's really the hard part. It's not knowing what to do. It's dealing with all the different variety of functions that you get. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, let's get let's get to work here then. Uh, so uh, so first we're going to find critical points. We said right. So find the derivative right. F prime of x. So what is the derivative of this function? Two thirds x squared plus x to the minus one third times two x plus one. Okay. All right. So what I suggest is um, I suggest you look for um, where the derivative uh, does not exist first. 
So where does it not exist? Well, um, let's rewrite it a little bit here. Um, so 2x plus 1, and then the negative exponent, move it down, right? So make sure that you're careful with your algebra while you're doing this. Um, are you guys okay if I do 4x plus 2 instead, maybe? over 3 times x squared plus x to the 1 third, like that. Okay, so um, the reason why you want to do where it does not exist first is because to find when it equals to 0, if you have a fraction, first thing you do is get rid of the denominator. Well, once you get rid of the denominator, then you've lost some of the points where the derivative doesn't exist. So you got to be careful. Um, so here, for example, um, so since I have a fraction, uh, I know that it doesn't exist when the denominator equals 0, right? So when does the denominator equal 0? So set x squared plus x equal to 0 and solve, right? Right? Is that? So do I know how to solve this? Certainly hope so. So what do I get? So what are those guys called? Yeah, those are critical numbers, right? So, um, so a good thing to do, so somewhere over here, maybe I'll, over here would be a good spot. Make a little box critical points. Okay, so so far I found two. x equals 0 is a critical point and x equals minus 1. Now those are critical uh, points where the derivative does not exist, right? Um, is that all the critical points? We don't know. Okay, so after we do that, then what do we do? Bless you. What's the other kind of critical point? Where the derivative equals 0, right? So the second thing is, where does the derivative equal to 0? Right? So that's the other question. So you want to do them separately. Um, and which one do you do first? Does not exist first. Yeah. OK, so we'll set it equal to 0. So 4x plus 2 over 3x squared plus x to the 1 third set that equal to 0. And then if I do that, what's the first thing you do to solve that? Yeah, multiply both sides by the denominator, right? Which just wipes it out, right? Because you have 0 on the right side, so then you just end up with 4x plus 2 equals 0. So what is x equal to? Negative 1 half. Okay, so are those the same, I mean, so, so what's the difference between those guys, the x equals 0 minus 1 and x equals minus a half? Just graphically, if you think about um, what the difference is there. Mm, well, now theoretically, the other ones can also exist too, right? Because, so when the derivative does not exist, does that mean the function doesn't exist? Not necessarily, right? So it could be a spiky point, right? Or a cusp. Uh, but it could also be a whole bunch of other things where the function doesn't exist, right? It could be a vertical asymptote, a whole bunch of things. Um, so, I mean, if you look at it, for example, look at the function. Does the function, uh, is it continuous at zero? The original function x squared plus x raised to the two-thirds. Can you plug in 0 and get a number out of it? Sure, you get 0, right? So is it continuous at 0? Sure it is. What about uh, minus 1? Can you plug that in? Yeah, right? So, um, so without looking at the graph at this point with our current level of knowledge, do we know what's going actually going on at 0 and at minus 1? 
We know the derivative doesn't exist. So what does that mean? What What do you guys think that? Well, it's not a flat spot because there's a flat spot at minus a half, right? Maybe a vertical tangent line, right? It can't be a vertical asymptote because then the function wouldn't exist, right? Uh, but it could be a, a vertical uh, tangent, right? could also be a cusp. Um, so we would have to do a little bit more experimentation to find out. Uh, we could find the limit, right, and do other things. So, um, okay, so all those things we'll kind of talk about in more detail as we keep moving forward. But um, as far as finding the absolute extrema, what's our next step? So I found all the critical points. Plug in the critical points, into the, the critical points into the original function, yes. And what else? And the endpoints. And compare, yeah, compare the large, yeah, compare the y values, right? Choose the largest and the smallest. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so this was step one, step two, uh, plug in, plug in critical points and endpoints, CPs and EPs into original. Now, this is another thing that also often gets confused or confuses students. So here we're working with a function, we're working with the first derivative, later on we're gonna work with the second derivative. Make sure that you're always clear where you're plugging in the x values um, and it's depending on what you're looking for. So what are we looking for to find the absolute maximum and minimum? We're looking for the value of the function, right? That's what we're looking for. So when you're looking for the value of the function, where do you plug it into? Into the original function. If you're looking for the slope of the tangent line or the derivative, uh, or what else does it t the first derivative tell you? What does it tell you graphically? Rate of change, Rate of change which also tells you whether it's also increasing or decreasing. Exactly. Um, that information you get from the first derivative. What information does the second derivative tell you? Mm -hmm. You guys remember? We did it when we talked about that table and all that jazz. The concavity, right? So that's so that's what you want to distinguish. Is that different parts? We're going to be looking for different things, and depending on what we're looking for, you you're going to plug in an x value into either the original, the derivative, or the second derivative. Yeah. So if you're looking for the value of the function, plug it into the function. If you're looking for whether it's increasing or decreasing, you plug it into the first derivative. If you're looking for the concavity, you plug it into the second derivative. Second derivative. Okay, all right. Burn that in your head. This is important. <laughs> okay, uh, but for now, we're going to plug it into the original. Okay, so off we go then. So we have, let's see here. So f. Uh, let me do this. Okay. Um, if when x equals zero, so f let me see. Y equals to f of zero, which is zero, right? Okay. I'll just leave it at that. When x equals minus one, y equals f of minus one, which is equal to Aha, I, is it zero? You sure? I'm just making sure, okay. Uh, let's see, and then x equals to minus one half, y is equal to f of minus one half, which is minus one half squared minus one raised to the two thirds. What is that? I don't know.
Okay. Yeah. So minus one half, right? Is that right now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So then, what is that? Okay. So minus a quarter to the two thirds. Okay. Let's see here. And then what else? Am I done? Do I com are those? Is that what I compare? The endpoints too, right? So don't forget the endpoints. So those are the critical points, and then the endpoints are x equals minus two. So y equals f of minus two, which is what is that? Two to the two thirds. Okay, and then when x equals 3, y is equal to f of 3, which is, what is that? 12 to the 2 thirds. Okay. All right. So which one's the max and which one's the min? So this is the max, right? The absolute maximum. What's the minimum? Mm. So what's negative one fourth to the two thirds? Is that positive or negative? <coughs> it's positive, right? Because you square it. Okay. All right, so All right, so these are the absolute minimum, right? So notice that the absolute minimum is um, So the absolute minimum is 0 and it's located at x equals 0 and x equals minus 1, right? Does that make sense? And then the absolute maximum is that is that 3 and it's 2 to the 2, 12 to the 2 thirds, sorry. Okay, is, notice, is that enough information for us to uh, draw the graph? Not really, right? Uh, we're missing quite a bit of information. Um, you need to know where, where it's increasing or decreasing, right? Uh, you need to know information about the concavity. So those are all things that we're going to take a look at uh, later. Um, for fun, I guess, we probably should graph it, right? Shouldn't we graph it just for fun? Okay, so x squared plus x raised to the there it is. So they're they're cusps, right? So that's why the derivative doesn't exist because they're cusps. Um, So notice the absolute maximum is over here somewhere, right? So you keep going there for a while, a little bit, at 3. And then the minimum it is at 0 and minus 1, and it's 0 at both. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. All right, you guys want to try one? All right, so then how would we solve uh, this? So we found the derivative. There's no points where the where it doesn't exist, and then we set it equal to zero. Um, okay, so that's a good idea. What else can I factor out? An x squared as well, right? So if I do that, I would get 3 minus 2x, and then equals to zero, right? Okay, so then notice if I solve, so here from x squared, I get that x equals zero is a critical point, right? Okay, and then from three minus two x, I get x is equal to three halves is another critical point, right? And then what about e to the minus two x? Well, when does e to the minus two x equal to zero? Never. 
right? You cannot raise a non-zero number to any power, no matter what, and get zero, right? It's just simply not possible. Um, so, you know, you can do certain things, you know, like if you forgot that, well, if you try to get the log of both sides, what would you get? Well, you should definitely should not get one. Ln of e is one, that's right. But what's ln of zero? Yeah, it's undefined, right? This does not exist, okay. So this is not, it's because it's not possible, right? So you cannot raise a non-zero number to a positive number, negative number, zero. You can't raise it to anything and have it equal to zero, right? Um, okay, so how many critical points do I have then? Two. Two, that's right. So these are my two critical points. So then after you do that, uh, then what do I do? <coughs> plug in the critical points, plug in the endpoints into the original, and then just compare the y values, right? So if I plug in 0, I get 0. If I plug in 1, I get e to the minus 2. I don't know what just happened there, but okay. Um, or one over e squared, right? Uh, if I plug in three halves, yeah. What is that? Twenty-seven eighths e to the mm, minus three, and then we have sixty-four e to the minus eight. All right, so we probably need to approximate these just to. Well, we could do it by hand, but yeah. What's 27 over 8? Uh, how many? 3. No. 3 and 3 eighths? Oh, no, I mean, but when you multiply it by e to the minus 3. How many? Okay, yeah, that sounds about right. Six, one, eight. Okay. Um, and what over e squared? Point what? Three ish. Okay. Um, yeah, that sounds better. Okay, and then sixty four e to the minus eight. Zero two two. All right. So, what do you guys think? So, what's the absolute max? So it's not three halves. For which one? Oh, okay, I just wrote it down wrong, right? Point one six eight. Okay. All right. So what's the absolute max? It's not three halves. Yeah. So it's twenty seven eighths e to the minus three, right? Or approximately 0.168, and it's at x equals 3 halves, right? So the x value is never the maximum, or the minimum. That's where it's located. The maximum or the minimum is always the y value, yeah? Okay. And then the absolute min, what is? Zero at? At x equals zero. Okie doke. So questions. So notice the steps are not difficult, right? I mean, the knowing what to do is not difficult. 
but it definitely is difficult to do these because of the different variety of problems. Basically, the only easy ones are polynomials, and that's it. Um, but um, you know, the whole point of studying calculus is so that you can look at more complicated functions and really understand what's going on. So, um, highly recommend to practice a lot. Practice a lot, um, and uh, um, what else can I tell you? Practice a lot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> The what? It says f prime of x uh, is greater than or equal to question mark and equal to none, but I don't know how you explain that. Oh, why? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so right here, when I said there was no points where it doesn't exist. So, it. I mean, it, the thing is that it it's different for every single function. So here, <coughs> what you're looking for is things that you know where... Um, uh, functions don't exist. So, for example, uh, a really big one is you end up with a fraction. Well, you know that the denominator can't equal zero. So that's a good thing to look for right away. So here, if I have uh, this function, well, this is the same as 3x squared over e to the 2x minus 2x cubed over e to the 2x, right? So it does have uh, fractions, right? So, but when does the denominator equal zero? Never, right? So, e to the 2x never equals zero. It's not possible. So, um, so you don't have to worry about that. But then you also need to look at the individual functions. So then you say, okay, well, uh, 2x cubed, 3x squared, are those ever um, discontinuous ever anywhere? Do they not exist? What's their domain? What? So they're just they're just power functions, right? So you don't they they're uh, defined everywhere, right? Um, and then what about e to the two x? Same thing, right? Continuous for all real numbers. So that's why you so that's what you kind of look at is you look at it piece by piece, and then you look at it all together, uh, and it depends. So like for example, I mean, so just to give you another example, let's say you say, oh, f prime of x is equal to um, you know, 2 square root of x minus 4 divided by tangent of x. And then you ask the same question. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them, right? Um, first of all, uh, there's restrictions on the domain right here. So you know that x has to be greater than or equal to 4 just from that right there, right? Uh, so if x is less than 4, then it's not, um, the derivative doesn't exist, right? Um, but then also, when does tangent equals to 0? A whole bunch of spots, right? So one of them is x equals 0, right? Where's the next one? pi, 2 pi, and so on, right? Yes or no? I thought it was pi over 2 pi. Well, we're not even there yet. So this is only because it's a frat, right? So tangents in the denominator. So you know that when the denominator equals 0, then um, it's not defined, right? So then... So that's where we're at, right? So 0 pi plus or minus pi plus or minus 2 pi and so on, right? But then the tangent function itself is not defined where? It's not defined at pi over 2. It's not defined at 3 pi over 2, right? Right, because it has vertical asymptotes. The tangent. So notice how there's two different things going on. One is, well, because tangents are the denominator, I need to look for where does it equal to 0? Because I know that derivative then won't exist. But then the tangent function itself doesn't exist for these other values, right? In this case, where the vertical asymptotes are, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, uh, and so on, right? Plus or minus. So how many critical points do we have there? We're really infinitely many, right? I mean, just, so I, I, mean, I just made it up to illustrate the point. Um, 
but but that's how you analyze it to um, to figure out where it doesn't exist and all that. So a reasonable amount of gas is the only way to get to the absolute amount of carbon. Right. Yeah. yeah. So typically, when you're looking for absolute extrema, almost always you'll have a closed interval. Not every single time, but most of the time. So then you would restrict yourself to that whatever that interval is. Um, well, you probably would be able to answer it because it's still periodic. So even though there's infinitely many critical points, yeah. it's probably the same value, right? So just like sine. So sine of x has infinitely many critical points, right? Infinitely many flat spots. But that doesn't mean you can't find what the absolute maximum and minimum is because it's the same value every time. So Does that make sense? So good times ahead, right? <laughs> yeah. Good times ahead. All right.